Um, our speaker tonight is John Spencer. He last spoke to us uh, the year before New Horizons made its uh, historic encounter with Pluto. Uh, we had Fran Baganal the month after that encounter uh, give us kind of a rundown on the initial stuff that came down. And John Spencer is going to do a follow-up on that. Uh, there's been time for additional data to be downloaded. There's been time for some papers to be written. And uh, some of that uh, uh, historic burst of data has been digested. It should be pretty interesting. Um, John is with the is, a, is an institute scientist at Southwest Research Institute, Department of Space Studies in Boulder. Uh, he's a native of England obtained his bachelor's degree in geology at Cambridge, PhD in planetary sciences at the University of Arizona. He spent four years in uh, postdoctoral positions at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, University of Hawaii, I'm on the wrong, 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 wrong line here. Uh, and then joined uh, Lowell Observatory, uh, and then joined Southwest Research Institute in January 2004. He is a specialist in the moons of the giant planets, uh, many of which kind of resemble Earth in, in geology. Uh, he has used uh, um, the Galileo spacecraft, the Cassini spacecraft, and the Hubble Space Telescope in studying various things on these moons. He's made a, a, quite a number of very interesting uh, measurements and discoveries uh, in doing that. In his spare time, while he's waiting for space probes to get to their destination. He is an avid uh, uh, amateur photographer, and he's also done some space art um, using um, software <laughs> and, and computers. Uh, he's got some rather interesting images on his, uh, uh, on his webpage, uh, which you can access if you go to uh, Swery. So um, without further elaboration, I'll introduce Dr. John Spencer. So yeah, we've been to Pluto. That's hard to believe. Um, I'm going to, I, I told you, uh, some of you, uh, about what we were expecting to do a couple of years ago, and Frank Baganal, uh, Stuart said, has given you a preview. Um, so hopefully what I say will not overlap too much with that, uh, but I'll just get started here. Um, so uh, a little bit of background first about what we knew about Pluto before we got there with the New Horizons spacecraft. Um, we knew it was, let's see, can I point here? Yes, I can. Um, here's the Earth way in here inside the asteroid belt. Here is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then Pluto in this kind of tilted, crazy orbit out beyond the giant planets. And for decades, Pluto was discovered in 1930, and for decades we had really didn't know what to make of it, but we now know there are hundreds of thousands of other objects out there uh, in that part of the solar system. Pluto is one of the largest, it's by far the brightest of those objects, but we now know there's um, at least one other object that's as big as Pluto, that's Eris, that is out here. Um, and so Pluto now has a family. It is not just this oddball on the edge of the solar system, it's now uh, the king of the Kuiper Belt. <laughs> and it's nice to uh, have put it in its place in the solar system. And so here are actually some of Pluto's siblings that we've learned about in the last 15 years or so. Uh, Pluto and his giant moon Charon. Here's Eris. This is kind of an old diagram. Makes Eris look bigger than Pluto. It's actually now we know a little bit smaller. Um, there's a little bit of smug satisfaction on the Pluto team when we, <laughs> when we finally got an accurate diameter of Pluto and we found that, yeah, it's actually just like 10 kilometers or so bigger than Eris. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's a couple of other things that are, you know, almost comparable in size, Makemaki, Haumea, and Sedna, and so on. Um, all a lot smaller than the Earth, but the largest objects that far out in the solar system, all very interesting places. Um, so before we got there, we made these kind of very imaginative artist's impressions of what Pluto might look like, because we really had no idea these were the best pictures here from Hubble, so you had to do a lot of extrapolation on that. <laughs> but, we, but we learned a lot from um, spectroscopy, and I don't know why that happened. Um, uh, 
that we learned that I, I okay I will hope it doesn't happen again we learned that the the surface is has a lot of frozen gases because it's so darn cold out there that the atmosphere is mostly frozen out on the surface as nitrogen methane carbon monoxide on the surface and then some very dark regions we knew there's some some dark spots in the Hubble images and um, this material we thought was some kind of organic molecules, not organic and produced by life, but carbon-rich molecules. Then we learned uh, in 1978 that Pluto has a big moon called Charon, and Charon is big enough that as it orbits Pluto, Pluto is also being pulled around its center of gravity, and they do this, this dance around their center of gravity because uh, Charon is, really has a large influence on Pluto itself. Uh, kind of like the Earth and the Moon. Uh, uh, Pluto, sorry, Sharon has a surface made of water ice with a little bit of ammonia. It's very different from all these weird exotic ices on the surface of Pluto. Um, and yeah, Pluto and Sharon together are about, you know, about the size of the United States here. Um, we knew Pluto had an atmosphere. Uh, we sort of knew how dense it was because uh, if you watch a star pass behind Pluto and measure the brightness of that star, if there was no atmosphere, the star, as it approached Pluto, would have constant brightness, and as it hit the edge of Pluto, it would suddenly wink out and then wink back on again on the other side of Pluto uh, as it come, came out the other side. But in fact, the star fades gradually as it goes behind Pluto, comes out gradually on the other side. So from that, we knew there was an atmosphere. We had some idea how thick it was, about 100,000 times thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, nitrogen um, and some methane and carbon monoxide, much like the surface of the uh, composition of the surface, in fact. Yeah. And then the last few years, we, in preparation for the Pluto mission, we started looking really hard at Pluto with the Hubble telescope, and we found that Pluto, Sharon was not the only moon. It has uh, four additional moons, which we call Styx, Nix, Cobras, and Hydra. They're quite small. Um, these are old diameter estimates, but they're, they're kind of close to, to the real sizes. Um, so, 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers is about the biggest of them. Um, for some reason, this is the ratio of the orbital periods to that of Charon. And Styx is about three times, goes around about three times more slowly. Nix goes around about four times more slowly. Cobras, about five times more slowly, has five times the rotation period. Hydra, about six times. And we have no idea why this is, but it doesn't seem like it's coincidence. There's something about the way the interactions between the moons that is making them almost but not quite all be nice regular clockwork arrangement. Uh, we think that the whole satellite system formed by a giant impact, and this is a, a simulate, computer simulation done by one of my colleagues uh, at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, who um, just did a computer model of two large objects in the Kuiper belt colliding with each other, and from that you can knock off this huge glob of material that can actually end up in orbit around uh, Pluto, and here we'd have Pluto and Charon, and maybe the small moons form the same way, but we still don't really know. And that's about all we knew about Pluto until uh, this summer, actually. Um, and so we wanted to learn more for a long time. We visited all the other classical planets, uh, ending with Voyager in 1989. And so shortly after that, people said, well, what about Pluto? We need to, we need to see what Pluto is like as well. So people have been studying missions to Pluto since the 90s. We finally got funding uh, for our proposal in late 2001 with Alan Stern, who founded our uh, office in Boulder, and um, he's uh, single-handedly made this mission possible, really. He's just been such a, a Pluto advocate for so many decades, and all his work has come to fruition this year. Um, so we got funding in 2001, we launched in January 2006, and it takes nine years to get to Pluto. Um, had a little boost from Jupiter along the way, and finally got to Pluto this summer. Um, so the spacecraft has a whole bunch of instruments, um, and this is just a sort of identity parade of all the instruments uh, that look at the, take pictures and measure the plasma and so on. But I'll go through them in a little bit more detail. We have a color camera. Um, it's here on the spacecraft, um, and it takes very wide-angle color pictures, so it's uh, 5,000 pixels across, and it sweeps those pixels across to make beautiful color pictures. Um, 
We can also map methane on the surface with that. Ah. Um, we have uh, a black and white camera, that's a telephoto camera, uh, that takes four times more detailed pictures. Um, we have an infrared instrument, which is breaking down the, the infrared light into 200 different wavelengths and measuring the brightness of each of those. And from that, we can learn about the surface composition because the infrared has a lot of information about what ices are made of in particular. Um, here is Alice, which um, is an ultraviolet instrument, and that is measuring uh, light that's shorter than the human eye can see, and that is absorbed by gases in Pluto's atmosphere, so we can learn a lot about Pluto's atmosphere from that. And then we have a couple of plasma instruments, and if you heard Fran Baganos talk, Fran has been in charge of a lot of the work with those instruments over the years, and these are used to measure the solar wind, or the charged particles flowing past Pluto, and get some idea of how much gas is escaping from Pluto, because we think Pluto's atmosphere is escaping, um, and we wanted to learn more about that. Uh, we actually use the radio transmitter, we use it to talk to the Earth, obviously, but we also use it to pass radio signals through Pluto's atmosphere and learn about the atmosphere, and so we have a special instrument called Ralph for that, sorry, for Rex for that. And then we have a student instrument that was built at the University of Colorado that actually measures dust impacts onto the spacecraft. It's on the bottom of the spacecraft that usually faces forwards in its journey, and as dust particles hit that, it, it can record those. Here's an actual picture of a couple of the instruments mounted onto the spacecraft, ready to get launched and do their job. This is the Alice ultraviolet instrument. This is um, the wide-angle camera and the infrared instrument that are all in the same package here and the other instruments are down on the other side. You can see a guy in the background, it's a pretty small spacecraft, it's about the size of a grand piano, something like that. And this also gives you a pretty good idea of, it. this is the spacecraft now built at Cape Canaveral, being unwrapped from its static, anti-static bag, uh, ready for integration and final checks before putting on the spacecraft. Here it is being wrapped in its beautiful golden insulation, uh, being hoisted on top of the third stage that will boost it out, and out of Earth orbit here. Uh, put in, oops, uh, put in the, the huge nose cone of the rocket. Um, you can see here it's a really rather small spacecraft and it looks a little lonely inside this huge <laughs> rocket fairing here. But we had a, a very small spacecraft and a very big rocket and that allowed us to go really fast. And that's what we needed to go to do so I could talk to you about Pluto now and not talk about us still having 10 years to go to get there. Um, here is the spacecraft now sealed in that rocket ferry, being uh, transported out to be hoisted on top of the Atlas V rocket here. Uh, this would have been in December 2005, just about 10 years ago, in fact. Um, maybe to the day. And then finally, in January 2006, we, we launched. Here's a picture of the launch, and the, rocket, the spacecraft is now inside the nose cone here. And, um, this, because it was such a big rocket and such a small spacecraft, it was the fastest ever launch uh, from the Earth's surface. And um, we passed the orbit of the moon in nine hours, which then it took us nine years to get to Pluto. <laughs> if you uh, some idea of the size of the solar system, and you know, we haven't even started with the rest of the universe there. Um, but it was quite, quite something to see there. And then only 13 months later, we got to Jupiter. <coughs> So we'd already blown past Mars and the asteroid belt in the first year of flight. Um, we were mostly using Jupiter just for its gravity to give us a bit of a boost to get us to Pluto faster, that saved a few years off the flight. Um, but as we went past, it gave us a wonderful opportunity to test out the instruments and learn a little bit about the Jupiter system. We were the eighth spacecraft to Jupiter, so we weren't making groundbreaking discoveries, but we did find some pretty cool stuff. Um, here we are flying past, you note that this is the position of Jupiter's moons at the time of closest approach, you see they were all on the opposite side uh, from where we were flying past here, so we didn't get very close to any of them. Uh, but still, here is uh, Jupiter's moon Io, Ju Io is this incredible moon, <coughs> excuse me, moon of Jupiter that is heated by Jupiter's tides to be incredibly volcanically active, and we took a lot of pictures of it, and this shows the capabilities of the different instruments. Um, here is our telephoto camera, Lori, which gets the most detailed pictures, and you can see here mountains on the 
uh, the sunset line of, of Io here, you can see the incandescent glow of, of lava from an active volcano on the night side here. So we'll get to the most detailed pictures with Laurie, um, this huge volcanic eruption here with the shadow of Io cut, cutting across it. Envic has less detailed pictures, but they're in color, so we can see that those lava flows are glowing red, and the uh, plume of volcanic material is a blue color, for, like very fine particles, like smoke. And the LISA instrument, the infrared instrument, is measuring the heat radiation from dozens, in fact, of other smaller volcanoes on the night side of Io. Here, so each of these cameras on the spacecraft learn, tells you different things about Io and also about Pluto, of course. Have you composited them? Or um, this is a you know, just a paste-up job here, uh, so you can compare them. Um, but uh, this is pretty much what Io would look like if you were on the spacecraft. I was just saying it would be great I mean, if you stacked them. That would really be something. Um, yeah, we can do. We we have played those kind of games. Um, and actually, this is a, a cool thing we're able to do. This is a movie. It's only five frames, but it's the first ever movie of an extraterrestrial volcano. So we were proud. Of that. And you can see the. The material falling down from this enormous. This is eruption is like 300 miles high. It's an enormous thing, uh, partly due to Io's low gravity, so you can blast stuff up really high. And then we took this beautiful parting shot. This is actually a combination of the color data from uh, the color camera, the higher resolution data from the black and white data. So it's like the best image we can get, showing again this enormous umbrella of volcanic debris from Io and the red glow of the volcano. A couple of other little volcanoes here. And then the moon Europa, where NASA is sending its next mission to the Jupiter system, um, that we think has an ocean underneath the nice surface. Um, so Jupiter system is really cool. We were sorry to say goodbye to it, but we had other places to go. Um, and then we had a long wait, actually. We had uh, eight years of flight to get to Pluto after Jupiter. And it's pretty much a straight line. Um, here's Jupiter. And here is the trajectory out to reach Pluto in July this year. Uh, we were very busy during that time uh, planning what we were going to do when we got to Pluto. Um, so it was not, not a boring period. Um, but we were very excited a year or so ago when we finally started approaching Pluto, started getting useful pictures of it. So here is what Pluto was looking like on the approach. Uh, in, in June uh, last year. This seems like so long ago. These were the best pictures we had of Pluto at that time. And uh, it's, it's prehistory now, and it was last June. It's very weird. Uh, but Pluto rotates every six days. So every six days, we'd see it go through, we see all the different sides of Pluto, and we'd see the, the appearance changing. And first, it was just kind of a blob, but we start seeing details, and uh, the details would repeat each time we went around every six days, we'd see the same side, but closer. And uh, this was the side we were going to see when we were closest to approach, so we were most interested in that. And we see a very bright region here, and some very dark regions right next to it, so it was already looking pretty exotic even in the middle of June, a month before we got there. And here's a movie we took um, on. Uh, this would have been uh, in, still in May, in fact. You can see Pluto rotating around in this blow-up view of Pluto. You can see um, the dark markings on the surface as they go around. And this is pretty exciting. We, you can't learn much about Pluto from that, but it's the best pictures ever taken, and every day they were getting better, and it was, a, a, it was an amazing time just to watch this every day. Um, and even at this distance, we were learning interesting things. This is uh, a view of Charon, the big moon of Pluto. And this is what the images look like originally, with a little bit of sharpening and processing. They look like this. And this is the North Pole of Charon. And we're used to polar caps. Uh, the Earth has ice polar caps. Mars has white polar caps. Charon has dark polar caps, which is really weird. Um, but totally unexpected discovery, even before we got very close. Um, and we couldn't wait for to see what we were going to learn as we got closer. Um, one thing that I was actually involved in a lot on the approach was looking for new moons and, and dust uh, those going around Pluto. Um, we got these four moons, uh, four outer moons, the Charon, Pluto and Charon, and then here is Styx and Nix and Cobras and Hydra, 
And these are actual images, long exposure images taken by the spacecraft on approach. We took all these long exposure images because we were going to fly through the Pluto system about here on the opposite side of Pluto from Shara. And we wanted to be sure we weren't going to run into any small moons or debris, dust from those moons. And so we took all these very long exposure pictures on approach to see if there were any new moons, any signs of any dust rings or anything that could the spacecraft might run into. It was particularly important because as we flew past Pluto, we were too busy taking data to send it back to Earth. It's all stored on board and we only get to send it back afterwards. So if the spacecraft had run into something at close approach and died, but we would never have learned all the stuff, cool stuff we've now been learning. Um, so we, we had plans if we did see something in the way we could divert the spacecraft to another trajectory. Um, so here's our fearless team of hazard watchers uh, <laughs> beforehand, during actually searching the images. We've had a Harry Potter magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> and then celebrating afterwards because we hadn't actually found any, any debris in the way um, that we could certify to NASA that the spacecraft would go ahead on its trajectory and we would be all set for the encounter. So that was a very satisfying moment to know that we'd certified the Pluto system safe for exploration. <laughs> um, so now we're getting down to about 11 days before closest approach and Pluto's beginning to look kind of weird. Um, this is the side opposite, the one we were planning to see close up. It's got this row of black dots along the equator. Here, the, this is the equator, the North Pole is up here. We're sort of looking down on the North Pole. And everything was going swimmingly until July 4th, when people were taking a long weekend uh, in preparation for the, uh, just to rest up before the encounter. And we, um, I'd been out, out and about, got back to my hotel room and got an email, well, the spacecraft had an anomaly and the computer crashed. And um, I'm glad I didn't find out earlier. People were in the control room monitoring transmissions from the spacecraft and um, they just stopped. Um, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, just sort of randomly the signal cut out in midstream. And it must have been a very scary hour or so. Uh, but some guy who was in the control room, or who they called and said, you know, I think I know what happened. It was, you know, this system overloaded probably. And if I'm right, we'll hear from the spacecraft again in about 15 minutes. And he was right. Just as he, when he predicted, the spacecraft kicked back in, uh, the signal started transmitting diagnostic information. It had failed, it, the computer had overloaded, and it, it knew exactly what to do, and it just reoriented, started sending diagnostic data back to the Earth. So um, I was not involved in the recovery, but it was fun listening in on the telecoms, and here I am. Did he get a raise for that? <laughs> <laughs> he certainly made a lot of people feel a lot better. He certainly deserved one. Um, but by the time I was involved, they'd heard from the spacecraft again. They sort of knew what the problem was. They knew how to fix it. But it was very fun listening into these telecoms. And it was one, if you, you know, see the Apollo 13 and the engineers working the problem and going through all the checklists of all the things that could have, have gone wrong, how to fix them. It was just like that. Um, and here's just a screenshot of people <coughs> going through the checklists of all the things they needed to do to recover. So it took about three days to get the spacecraft back on its feet, but a couple of days later we knew everything was going to be okay. Um, and we, we had, a, <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a reception for the team, everyone was gathering. Uh, this is at Light Physics Lab in uh, Maryland, where we, the mission, the spacecraft was actually built. This is Alan Stern, um, and this is the, the project manager, Glenn Fountain. Um, um, being pretty happy that things are now back on track and we can look forward to the encounter. These are actually, as you might gather, Green Bay Packers cheesehead <laughs> things, which are about the right shape and size to make New Horizons answer. Okay, so we were back in business. This is now, by the time the spacecraft was up and running again and taking data, we had just one Pluto rotation left to get there. So this is the side of Pluto we were going to see up close, but this is one Pluto day earlier, so in the next six, six or seven days, Pluto was rotating and getting closer. We were seeing stuff uh, at the best we would ever see it. Three days out, it was looking really kind of weird. This is the backside of Pluto that we will never see any better than this. And 
who knows what's happening here, but it's really very intriguing stuff and we'll be speculating about it for decades. Um, here now is, this is the last picture we got until the day of encounter, uh, two days before approach, and now we're seeing the bright region that we're going to see up close. Uh, actually, I should go back and just mention, if this is when we realized Pluto had a heart, and we had this beautiful heart-shaped bright marking here, which happened to be on the side we saw up close. And here it is again, rotating back into view for its close-up, as we're coming in at a, uh, 14 kilometers a second, uh, to look at that area in enormous detail the next day. Um, so this is all the stuff the spacecraft was doing on the closest approach day. Um, I will not explain this to you, it'll be happy <laughs> here. Uh, but you need to, here's Pluto, here's Sharon, there are the shadows stretching out, the sun is over here. The spacecraft is coming back by in a straight line, and each of these colored bars is one kind of observation it was making as it went past. A very complicated series of observations over the, over the whole day, and it was too busy to really talk to us. But just in case something went wrong beforehand, it's, it turned back to the Earth somewhere out here a few hours before closest approach and sent one picture down that was the best then. Had the spacecraft been run into something at closest approach, um, this would have been the best picture we ever got. And some of us uh, had the exciting job of being up. In, it came in around 11 p.m. We wanted to show it at the press at 8 a.m. So some of us had to be up all night to process that image. Here is our first view of that image, here's the magic wand again. Um, on the computer screen, for the first time, we've seen not just an enigmatic blob, but we've seen craters, we've seen fault lines, we've seen all kinds of amazing stuff for the first time ever. Uh, here's the, 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 uh, the team of image processors working on this uh, through the night, this is about 1 a.m. So here's the image, we sharpened it up, uh, we added color, and then we finally got about an hour's sleep, and it was announced to the world the next morning at 8 a.m. on the day of the encounter. And this image went viral, and it was everywhere. Obama tweeted it personally, and it's just really bizarre to be like one of five people who had seen that image several hours before anybody else. Um, but encounter day, we didn't get much data down. It was just a matter of um, talking to the press and explaining what we were doing, it was very exciting, but we didn't learn much more about Pluto on Encounter Day because the spacecraft was just busy doing its thing and not talking to us. So the next day we, we came into the office, got a little bit of sleep, and came back in to see the first close-up pictures. And here we are, gathered around, seeing some of the first pictures coming in, um, uh, in close-up. And what we were actually looking at here is here's that picture we worked on the previous day. This is now a close-up of this region here and uh, the first view of Pluto in any kind of real detail. And here's that picture, it was just totally blew us away. Um, huge mountains here, these are mountains, as the highest of the Rocky Mountains, but on a much smaller world. Totally weird stuff here that I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, and, and ice plains here, and the thing that struck us right away is there aren't any impact craters here. Um, there isn't a single thing on here that looks like a crater. And craters form on any planetary surface just as a matter of age, that if something is around for a long time, comets and asteroids will, kite belt objects in the case of Pluto, will smash into it and dig holes. And the fact we didn't see any holes being caused by things colliding with it just means this is a very young surface. It means Pluto, in this one picture we can see Pluto is an active world. It's not just a dead, cratered ball of ice. There's stuff going on there up to the present day, and really bizarre stuff too. Um, so that really wet, wet our appetite, and then over the weeks and months since then, we've been getting down more and more pictures every day. We got our best ever pictures down this last week, um, and we're seeing even more detail. Um, so this now is a, a global map of Pluto. We, we never saw the southern hemisphere because it was in the dark through the whole encounter, uh, but we got a pretty good view of this side where the heart is, uh, not so good over here. <laughs> and this is the region we saw really in close up, about half of Pluto, or maybe a third of the total if you count the bottom part. So, this is the part of Pluto we now know pretty darn well. Um, so, this is our gorgeous uh, 4000 pixel full color image uh, that we, we got down. I think we got this down in late September. Um, and you can zoom way in on this, and I'll show you a few uh, uh, close-ups, though it's hard to do it really justice on a screen like this. Uh, but you can download this on the web, and you can 
browse around it and see all the fabulous stuff in this image close up. Um, now the heart doesn't look quite so simple anymore. You can see one half here is very smooth, the other half is very rough. The heart is broken into two to totally different regions. Um, but one of the most remarkable places on Pluto is this big yellowish pale pl plane here that we're calling Sputnik Plan. We don't have official names for anything yet, but we, we have to call them something, so that's what it's called for now. Um, and uh, we actually can map the composition with our wonderful infrared instruments, so we know there's a lot of methane here. This is a view that this is the view you'd see with your own eye, or if your own eye could see a little bit of infrared. This is where the methane is from our infrared mapper, and you can see there's a lot of methane in this region, not so much over here, and so on. But there's also here lots of nitrogen carbon monoxide in this region. Here's kind of a close-up of that. You can see all kinds of really, really weird stuff going on up here. And you can begin to see here, if you're at this end of the room, uh, it's kind of divided into a bunch of polygonal cells. Um, when you really zoom in on it, with the kind of images we have now, oh, that first image I showed you that got us blown away was this little region down here. So we hadn't seen nothing yet at that point. We've now got beautiful imaging of this whole region. But zooming in on this region here, this is what the Sputnik planum looks like close up. You can see it's made of these sort of polygonal cells here. Something here that looks like a, a Klingon. We'd be having no idea what's going on with this thing. Like Klingon. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Klingon like warbird, that's right, I'm not just sure. um, And no craters again. This is a very young active surface. Um, when we look closer at other parts of Sputnik Plan, this is a region up near the top here. You can see here, you don't need to be a, an expert to see this stuff is flowing. It's a very soft, gooey kind of ice that is flowing between these mountains like a glacier. Um, and so that's part of why we don't have craters there. This is made of something really soft. It's probably nitrogen um, uh, ice. And nitrogen ice, even at the temperature of Pluto, is pretty soft and can move around easily. Yeah. So are you saying the number of circular features near the top are not crater -like? Oh no, those are craters. Okay. So we have very young stuff here. I'm glad you, you asked that, so I can clarify that. Yeah, parts of Pluto have a bunch of craters, and if I zoom out, you can see here, here are impact craters. This whole region is pretty old. This region is very old. This is the oldest, the oldest regions of the moon because it's completely covered in craters. And it's right next to regions that have no craters at all, so there's incredible variety of stuff on Pluto. Um, very young, very old surfaces. Yeah? I'm well, just curious, and, uh, you mentioned that there was a narrow resonance of the uh, satellites. Mm -hmm. Would that have an effect on, mm -hmm. I don't know, a heating effect? Or oh, like a tidal effect? As, uh, as that Jupiter has an IO. Mm -hmm. That does happen in the Jupiter system. Uh, the moons are in resonance with each other, and that causes heating of Io. Um, that's not happening on Pluto. Um, the other moons are too small to do anything like that, because they're just, you know, a few miles across. Um, and Pluto and Charon, they're very close to each other, they have a big tidal effect on each other, but they're locked solidly together. So there is no relative motion, they just sort of go around each other in lockstep. And so there's no distortion, no continual distortion to produce heating. So, we don't think tides are anything to do with why we have a young surface here. Um, so yeah, old, old material here, but even the old material I can see is eroded in weird and wonderful ways. And then this totally bizarre, vast nitrogen sea, as far as we can tell, like nothing known anyone had ever seen before. And we think these polygons that cover the surface are probably convection, like it's bubbling, um, porridge on a stove or something, you'll get these convection cells where stuff up wells in the middle and then goes down at the edges. So it's kind of like a glacier, but glaciers on the Earth don't convect, so no one has ever seen anything like this before. What is the temperature on that surface? It's uh, In Kelvin, it's about 40 Kelvin, uh, above absolute zero, about minus 350 Fahrenheit, I think that is. And what's the freezing point of nitrogen in, in, in Kelvin on uh, um, so it's it's Earth's, Earth's atmosphere? Uh, it's liquid at 77 Kelvin, that's how we, um, you know, liquid nitrogen is pretty easy to come by on the Earth. Yes. Um, um, I think about 60 Kelvin. So it might be well be liquid at depth. It might be solid on the surface and then get 
uh, warm enough underneath to uh, be liquid. And because it's fairly close to its melting temperature, I think that's why it can flow and move around so easily and produce these amazing patterns that we see. Um, as well as uh, uh, the plains, we have these mountains along the edge, uh, including some of the first ones we saw. There's a huge chain of mountains here. Um, they're, they're up to five kilometers high, and those high as the Rockies, they are um, very steep sided, so we think these must be made of water ice, not nitrogen or methane ice, which is too soft. So we have a, ice, a crust of water ice. Um, so here, yeah, here are several of those mountain ranges. And in fact, we know there's water ice because with our wonderful infrared instrument, we can measure the composition of spots on the surface here. And in this, the blue is where there's water ice on the surface, and it's along this fracture here. And then here are some of those mountains, and there's a lot of water ice showing up in those mountains. And then for who knows what reason, this water ice shows up in these regions too. Um, so there's a lot of information here. Here's a close-up of one of those sets of mountains, and these are not like mountains we've ever seen anywhere else. Um, they're this jumbled mass of tilted, crazy tilted blocks of ice near the edge of Sputnik Plan. Um, they look a little bit like, if you're familiar with the surface of Europe, Jupiter's moon Europa, there are parts of that surface where an ice shell is being broken up and things are jumbled, but not quite on this scale. If we zoom in here, here are these uh, very rugged mountain blocks uh, lapping up against the nitrogen sea here. It's just a completely crazy landscape. You wouldn't uh, consider it analogous in any way to the uh, rumpled surface of Venus, for example. Uh, it doesn't look like It has Venus. spatial frequency comparable. Yeah, uh, but you don't get these discrete jumbled blocks in the same way. Europa is, I think, the closest that we see like this. Here is one of the closest, uh, closest pictures. This picture came down um, about, about a week and a half ago. This is the highest resolution we will ever see of Pluto, at least until someone sends another mission there. So here are those polygons that we think are convecting cells in the nitrogen and the shoreline against this incredibly rugged, jumbled mountain range. Are those dunes? Um, we, we are really baffled by these things. Mm. There shouldn't be dunes on, they look kind of like dunes, yeah, yeah but there shouldn't be dunes on Pluto because the atmosphere is too thin to move sand around on the surface. Maybe it was thicker at one time, and maybe that's part of what's going on there, we don't really know. Maybe ripples? Yeah, but again, the atmosphere shouldn't be thick enough to make those. Um, the best idea we have at the moment, and I'm not sure it's right, is that sunlight is evaporating the nitrogen layer Mm. And it's like penitente sun cups that you can get on ice fields on mm. um, the, the high mountains on Earth, maybe, but they don't really look like that either, and they're much bigger. <coughs> um, to give you a sense of scale, here's another mountain front that we're more familiar with. <laughs> um, this is about the same scale. We are. We must be down here somewhere, and this is downtown Denver. Here's here's my home in Boulder. So this is pretty much the same scale that we're looking at here. So we're seeing details on Pluto down to the size of city parks. It's really amazing what we can do with this little spacecraft. Um, but any, any other resemblance is probably purely coincidental. Uh, and then we've got glaciers, things that are very obviously glaciers pouring down into, uh, this is from the one side of the Broken Heart down into Sputnik Platinum on the other side. Coming down here out of the highlands, there seem to be glacial flow and thing, flow kind of puddling out into the ice there. And we think this is probably flowing nitrogen, we don't know what else it could be. And then the stuff that we, we are really scratching our heads over. This might be an ice volcano of some kind. It's a huge hole in the ground, many kilometers deep, surrounded by this concentric structure, all these really crazy knobby surfaces. Are, we just have no good explanation for this at the moment, but it's kind of circular, it has a hole in the middle, then therefore it's maybe a volcano, that's about the best the geologists can say right now. Uh, but it's spectacular and like nothing we've ever seen before. Um, here's other totally weird stuff. Um, we call these dorsi or ridges, which doesn't tell you anything about what they are because we don't know, but uh, we uh, dragon skin or snake skin terrain is another word we've come up with for this. Uh, but really crazy stuff going on here. 
And then there's the plains up in the north uh, have these, like they've been covered over with thick layers of something that has eroded away and produced these huge depressions and scarps. And here it looks like things have been eroded by almost by rivers, but they can't be rivers on Pluto. Maybe there are little glaciers flowing down from the mountains. Um, lots and lots of really wonderful stuff. And then we, as we flew past, we, we looked back and we got views that start to show the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very thin, like I said, but it's full of haze, which when you look back towards the sun, the haze, when it's back, like, shows up pretty well. And so, here, so here's probably the most spectacular view uh, that we got on the mission, um, looking back towards the sun. Here again is Sputnik Plum, the vast nitrogen ice. The, here are some of those mountains, and in fact we can zoom in on that because it's a really detailed picture, and this is... Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's what we thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... It's like you're looking out an airplane window. It's, 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 it's just amazing. Um, mountains rising many kilometers. This is kind of the height of Pikes Peak, probably, on the skyline here. Looks kind of like Pikes Peak. Um, you see the nitrogen ice here kind of glistening in the sun. Um, long shadows being cast by these mountains here. It really it looks like quite a basin where that ice is, where the nitrogen yeah, is. Yeah, we're wondering if this is a giant impact, a very ancient giant impact that got thrown with nitrogen, something like that. Um, it's, that's maybe the most likely explanation for why there's this big hole full of nitrogen here. And then just these layers and layers and layers of thin haze in the atmosphere going up for 100 miles or more. Um, going back here, if we look over here, this is where the glaciers are flowing into Sputnik Plan. And when you look at that area up close, you can actually see the glacial flow, flow lines, uh, the glaciers coming down onto the, uh, onto the plains from the highlands up here. So maybe we have some kind of nitrogen cycle, like we have a hydrological cycle on the Earth. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just can't get over the contrast between, you know, on some parts of Florida you have very ancient structures, and then other parts it's, it looks very young. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's very odd. <laughs> it's a bit like Mars, actually. There are parts of Mars that are very ancient and have a lot of craters. Other regions like the giant volcanoes on Mars that have very few uh, that have been eroded. It's kind of the same range of ages as Mars. It's certainly just as geologically interesting as Mars is. Um, and yeah, so maybe there's this kind of nitrogen cycle that we get condensation of nitrogen in the highlands and it flows back down through these glaciers back into this sea. Yeah. Now one question. Uh, where in its orbit is, is Pluto compared? Is it Closest to the sun, furthest away, or someplace in between? It was at its closest to the sun in 1988, I think. So it's still fairly close. Um, and so it's still fairly close. It's 250-year orbit. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Um, so it's receding from the sun right now. <coughs> and so we might expect the atmosphere to, to freeze out on the surface as it gets farther from the sun. And I was going to say, I wonder what this would look like 200 years from now. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, we. Well, <laughs> One of the reasons we Spring gave for wanting to go to Pluto yeah. now is we wanted to get there before the atmosphere froze out. And we certainly succeeded at that, but we think it will probably, if not freeze out all the way, get a lot thinner when it's at its furthest from the sun. Um, oh, the other thing we think might be happening here is the nit nitrogen is heavier than ice when it's solid. And it might actually seep underneath the crust here and maybe undermine blocks of ice and make them float and move around and produce these masses. Does that, does that exactly follow? Because the theory you had for what you're calling a sea mm -hmm. was it was convective. So therefore mm -hmm. it should be closer to liquid for like right at the bottom where it's under pressure. Well, well, actually the convection helps it stay solid because it, it prevents the heat from building up at the base enough to melt it. Okay. So it's convecting um, like yeah, a slush, is that it? Yeah, it's like you stir the soup on your stove so it doesn't burn at the bottom. Right. If you stir it up, it doesn't get quite so hot at the bottom, and so it might not melt. If it melts, it's actually less dense than ice, but if it's frozen, it's more dense than ice, so it's, it's different from water ice uh, in interesting ways. So there could be a boundary layer with, with some interesting things happening. Oh yeah, I think there's lots of interesting things happening over here. People are already getting their supercomputers warmed up to. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But so yeah, we don't really know what's happening here, but there may be this kind of thing going on. And then on our departure, we've got images like this. Um, the, the, the haze is blue, and it's so extended that we can see all the way around Pluto. Even though this is the sun isn't, you'd think maybe the sun is behind Pluto here, like it was an eclipse, but it's not. The sun is actually way off in this direction, beyond the exit sign. And uh, but you still, even on the dark side of Pluto, you see the the haze uh, lit up. It sort of extends so high into the atmosphere. Um, so that's Pluto. Um, we mustn't forget Charon here. This is an actual. Uh, single image of Pluto and Charon, about the best image we have that contains <coughs> both objects. Uh, that, so it shows their correct sizes and relative distances because it's just a straight image from the spacecraft. So here is Charon with its dark pole. But we have much better images of Charon too. This is the best color image of Pluto Charon that we, we took. Um, here is that mysterious dark pole. It looks just as mysterious in close-up as it did in those very first images. We still don't understand what's going on there. Uh, we have an idea, and it's kind of crazy, but it's, we haven't thought of a better one, which is Pluto's atmosphere is escaping at some rate, not nearly as fast as we originally thought, actually. We learned that from New Horizons. But some of it is leaking out into space, and that contains methane. And some of, as it flows away from Pluto, it's flowing past Charon. And on the winter side of Charon, the pole is in darkness for 100 years and gets very, very cold maybe some of that methane freezes out on the pole on the night side and then it gets cooked up into some kind of hydrocarbon tar stuff that darkens the surface so it doesn't evaporate in the next summer. And maybe over billions of years that could produce these, the dark pole on Charon. But we don't really know. Uh, but then, as, apart from that on Charon, we see Charon is not a um, dead, uh, uh, uninteresting world either. It's got craters everywhere, so we know this is all pretty ancient. Uh, but this region down here is, is relatively smooth. It's kind of like the dark Mari regions on the moon. It's some kind of lava plain, maybe. And then we have a highland region here, this spectacular belt of mountains and faults separating the two. Um, uh, this is a close-up view of, uh, of the plains region here. You can see it's got all kinds of interesting patterns on it that we don't understand. Um, and we have stereo here that shows there are, there are canyons many kilometers deep cutting through this whole region. Uh, oh, this is a bit more of a close-up. You can see the weird and wonderful textures in this smooth plain. See, we think the best the idea we have is this is some kind of slurry of water and ammonia which can be very gooey and flow across the surface and fill in the, the plains here. Here's someone was asking earlier about the mountain in the moat that people have seen on Sharon, this is the best view we have of that. There's a mountain here, and it, yeah, it's got a moat around it, and we think maybe this f ammonia water lava has just flowed towards it, but it's too gooey to just really fill in all the way around it, and maybe that's what makes that moat, we don't know. Is there any guess as to how old Sharon is? Um, well, is parts of it are very heavily cratered. Most likely, if it was formed in a giant impact, and we think it probably was, that would have been much more likely to happen shortly after the solar system formed, when there was a lot more material to run in, so into Pluto. So it's probably for bit, four and a half billion years. Sometime like the formation of Ireland. Yes, right, and may have formed in a similar way. Yeah. Yeah, but since they both look visually so different, uh, does the spectroscopy of both bodies support the um, impact hypothesis? Well, they look very different. Uh, I, this is water ice. It's similar to the stuff in if you've got any left in your water glasses here. Um, uh, though it's got ammonia in it, you wouldn't want to drink it. Uh, but Pluto, is, whereas Pluto has just a little bit of water ice in the, it's just a few patches, and the rest of Pluto's surface is covered in more exotic ices than nitrogen and then methane and the carbon monoxide. And I think if you scratch the surface of Pluto, you'll see it's similar to Sharon underneath. But the, the very surface is covered in all these other more exotic ices. Probably just because it has enough atmosphere and enough gravity to hold on to those other ices and they've evaporated off Sharon. But they're probably both similar stuff in the interior, certainly their densities are similar. Um, and then we have the small moons, the four moons. We did not find any more moons uh, beyond these four, but we learned interesting things about these. This is the 
the sizes and shapes, uh, we'll get a few more good pictures, but these are almost the best we're going to get. Um, so Nixon and Hydra are a lot bigger than sticks and Cobras, but they're all kind of irregular and lumpy and elongated. The thing on here, they're compared to Sharon. You can see they're much, much smaller than Sharon. Um, the thing that's been most interesting uh, to several of us on the mission has been uh, the way these moons rotate. And we, you know, we're familiar with moons. Our moon always has the same face facing, facing the Earth. So it's sort of got a rotation period equal to its uh, orbital period. And that's true for nearly all the moons in the solar system. It is not true for Pluto's moons. Here is a, a movie of the rotation of the moons. <laughs> now the sizes are exaggerated here and the colors are not terribly realistic, but you can, see, you can see Pluto and Charon in the middle here are behaving like sensible worlds there. Charon, Charon is point, always has the same face pointed at Pluto, and in fact Pluto always has the same face pointed at Charon. But then these other guys, uh, they're just, they're not behaving at all. Um, Styx, ro Styx rotates about 10 times faster than Kerberos does. Uh, Hydra is somewhere in between. Uh, Hydra's rotating backwards. Um, uh, so I can, um, no, I'm, I get the moon's neck. Oh, let me start again. This is Hydra. Hydra's rotating 10 times faster than, than Kerberos. Uh, Nyx is rotating backwards, Styx is somewhere in between, um, and I, I like the quote of my friend and colleague Mark Showalter, who did a lot of the work on these, that he was expecting chaotic interactions between them where they would just have to be <coughs> periods that changed a lot. Um, he said, you know, we expected chaos, but we got pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't know what's going on here. Oh, and they're not orbiting, they don't have the poles are all in every in crazy directions. They're not aligned with the orbit planes or anything. Epicycles so that's been the most interesting live. thing so far. Huh? Epicycles still live. Something like that. Yeah, we, we have no idea really what's going on there. So uh, we're going to have fun trying to figure that out. Okay, so that's a lightning tour of the Pluto system, but we're not done with the mission yet. Uh, we're continuing on beyond Pluto out into the Kuiper Belt. We're now already one astronomical unit beyond Pluto, that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. We've traveled that in the four months since the encounter. Um, <laughs> we're continuing out uh, into the region of much denser uh, Kuiper Belt objects. And from before the mission was launched, we knew we wanted to visit one of these guys. There are hundreds of thousands of small objects out here. Unfortunately, they're not quite as densely packed as this. And, um, but we thought there ought to be enough in the little bit of space that we can reach by nudging the spacecraft trajectory with a little bit of fuel we had, that we could visit one of these other objects. And these are worlds we know almost nothing about. We didn't even know they existed until about 20 years ago. So we really want to visit one and get up close. And I worked a lot with other people for many years trying to find objects that were in the direction we were going. We knew of, there were hundreds of thousands of Kuiper Belt objects, but finding one just along our path was really hard, and we used a lot of telescope time, weren't successful. So in 2014, we finally got time on the Hubble telescope, uh, which, because it has much sharper images, was finally able to find us an object. And so here, here is our first discovery with the Hubble telescope, maybe about a year and a half ago now. And we're running a movie backwards and forwards here. So inside that green circle, you can see a faint dot of light, and uh, this object is the first one we found with Hubble. We then used another 150 orbits of expensive Hubble time and eventually decided this was the one we could actually reach, uh, the one that we found very early in the process just by down luck. But we didn't know that at the time. We did have to go and com complete the rest of the search. So here is an object. It's just a, a few noisy pixels here, but this is something we're going to see up close and personal in, on January the 3rd. Um, uh, first 2019. Wow. Um, in just three years from now. What is, wow. that, what is that fairly bright object that's just about stationary in that group? These are all stars. There are many, many background stars. Okay. Yeah. So it, we can know this is a Kuiper Belt object because it's moving it's against moving the star the against star background. Stars. Yeah. Um, and obviously it was a lot harder to find without the green circle around it. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a huge effort by uh, nice. a bunch of really talented people to actually spot this in the thousands of pictures that we took. Oh, yeah. 
But yeah, we were a big sigh of relief. We actually found this guy. We found one other we could reach, but it would have taken nearly all our fuel, and we wanted fuel for other things. This one was easier. Hmm. So it has a, a designation now. It doesn't have a name yet. We want to have a naming contest. Um, uh, Alan Stern is threatened to name it after the NASA administrator uh, until he gets around to organizing the naming contest just to, <laughs> just to, <laughs> contest just to embarrass him. Um, but uh, here's where it is. Here's, this is pretty much a scale diagram. So here is Pluto, here's our trajectory continue out, out in a straight line. Uh, PT1, potential target one, is what we've been calling it. Because 2014 MU69 is a bit of a mouthful. Um, the other one that we might have been able to reach was PT3 here that we're not going to. But it has a circular orbit, much more sensible orbit than Pluto's actually. It's a flat orbit, it's almost circular, it's in the same plane as the rest of the planets. Um, mm. It probably formed here in its current location, so it's a very primordial, very pristine part of the solar system. We can't wait to see it up close. And so in yeah, January 1st, 2019, we'll fly by this guy. I was this afternoon working on plans for what pictures we'll take when we get there. And as well as this one, we'll look at a bunch of other, maybe a dozen other Kuiper Belt objects from a distance as we fly through the Kuiper Belt. So we'll um, we won't see them as more than points of light, but we can see them from different angles than you could ever see from the Earth. But we may be able to find moons and things like that, so that would be very interesting. And just a, a month ago, we, we took our first picture of a Kuiper Belt object other than the Pluto system. We were excited about that. Here it is, another moving dot against the star background, but this is taken from the New Horizons spacecraft with its telephoto camera. This is 1994 JR1. Um, uh, it's still about two astronomical units away from the spacecraft. It will come within about half an astronomical unit in April. We'll be looking at it again then. It will be several times brighter at that point. But we are now in the Kuiper Belt and we are um, on our way to the next phase of the mission. And uh, so with that, I will, I will leave it except I have some pictures which maybe people can look at afterwards and uh, I will just show these are stereo pictures, and if I'd been really well organized, I would have brought lots of red blue glasses for everyone to borrow. <laughs> but in, I was not so organized, but I have a few, and if you want to come up and look at uh, this in stereo, it's probably better from closer up anyway. Uh, when we're done, um, you're very welcome to do so, uh, but in the meantime, I'll be happy to answer any more questions. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea what its uh, what its day is like, or how long it is? We don't know much about it yet. We know it varies in brightness quite a bit in the Hubble images we've taken, um, by up to sixty percent. Uh, so it's probably quite elongated. We don't know its rotation period yet. We just know it's a different brightness every time we look at it. Okay. Um, so we're going to try and figure out the rotation rate. We may be able to do that. Typically, they're around ten hours. <coughs> But it could be half that, it could be twice that. The other um, question I was just curiosity. Did you ever meet Clyde Tombaugh? I did. Um, back when I was a grad student, uh, we were at the same conference. I maybe said hi, I don't remember. But I, I certainly didn't know him well. Alan Stern, who uh, was our, our leader on the mission, he knew Clyde pretty well. We did get to talk to his widow, Patsy Tombaugh, at the launch. She died. Of, couple of years ago, but she was very much alive and uh, well at the time of the New Horizons launch, so uh, it was great to meet her and talk to her. And, uh, Jane and I actually lived in their house, strangely enough, when we were at Lowell Observatory. Um, they, we, we lived on the grounds, and it's not strictly the same house, but they had the same basement. <laughs> they, they replaced the house and we built another one in the same basement, that, um, so we were talking to her about life at Lowell Observatory which we, we had shared with her, so it's cool to have that in common with her. I think it's interesting that you met Clyde Tama, who discovered the planet, and now you get to work on it. Yeah, isn't that weird? Um, and of course, some of Clyde Tama's ashes are on the spacecraft, and actually yeah, through that. thousands of miles from the world we discovered, which is totally strange. Yes. So are you getting complete data back on this? Is there any loss due to compression? Um, we, the first pictures we sent back, we compressed the heck out of them just in order to get them back quickly. So we had some quick look stuff and we could show the, the press. And 
and get our first look at the, the data. And then we were going to send everything back compressed, and we thought better of that, and we now send every, everything back at full fidelity, and it's taking longer. Um, uh, but we can get it down faster at full fidelity that way. So we, we, every last every last pixel that was taken is going to come down, even the ones of the empty sky next to Pluto, because who knows, there might be some, somebody might find something interesting in those someday. So, and that will take until uh, next fall to get every last pixel down. But we prioritize it, so the most interesting stuff has come down uh, this fall, and we still got some really juicy stuff on the spacecraft, but uh, by January we should have most of the, uh, the highest priority stuff down, and then it'll be uh, more distant views or views of the sky next to Pluto and some so on coming down over the months after that. Yeah. Uh, well, um, thank you uh, all, and thanks for having me and sharing your your holiday dinner with me. It's been great. Thank you.